It has truly been, a, been performed by representatives from organizations throughout the Allegheny Highlands. And our work really has been guided with this thought in mind, and it might be best uh, expressed by Tom Filsack, who used to be the Secretary of Agriculture. And he said that people working together in a strong community with a shared goal and a common purpose can make the impossible possible. And this is really what's been happening. We have had the shared goal, shared goal of enhancing health throughout our community, and then the purpose has been to devise a way to do just that. And before I get into the process, let me say that when we talk about health, we are certainly talking about health in a grander way than just physical health. So physical health is certainly important and we can't really do much without it. But if we're truly going to be healthy individuals and have healthy families and a healthy community, then we have to have transportation and good schools to send our kids to and we have to have uh, areas where we have low crime and uh, a community that is filled with hope and we have to have appropriate housing and friendships, et cetera, et cetera. So when we talk about building community, we are really talking about all the facets that go into making us healthy. And so with respect to the work, this, the focus has been enhancing health, and this is the process that we engaged in. So we first set out to really invite the community in, and this was an open door process, very transparent. We took whoever wanted to participate to, in the work, and as you saw from the logos, the response was really phenomenal. So once we engaged the community, we collected data, and we spent a lot of time doing this data collection. So we looked at data from sources that currently existed, and then we determined that in order to really enhance the pool of information, we wanted to hear directly from the residents. So we devised two surveys for the resident, a first small survey, and then we used the small survey and the secondary data to actually develop our primary large survey, and hopefully, this talk about surveys isn't a surprise to you because many of you perhaps have completed one or both of them. So once we collected the data, the next step was then to analyze it. And again, that's analyzing all of the data that we had. We had our hands on the data that existed already, so whether it was on transportation or housing or education. And then, it then we supplemented that data with the data that we collected from residents. We analyzed it and saw from the analysis that there were some ideas and topics that rose to the top. And you'll see a list of those as I proceed. But after we analyze it, we then prioritize what the work, what's possible with the work. And then we developed a plan or an action plan for addressing the priorities. And we are at this point at the implementation stage. So we are on the ground working in the community to address the priorities that the community identified. <coughs> so this has been our timeline. The work actually started in September, fall of 2016. And you'll see that since then, we have been sort of on a path to where we are now. And it's really been a well thought out process that would not have been possible without <coughs> the rest of the community. So as I mentioned, we collected secondary data in what we called a data binder. So those that have spent time with the work may be familiar with that data binder. It's a big book that contains all of the data that existed for the area. <coughs> We then did the initial survey and collected 908 completed surveys with the second survey, which was the big one. This is a survey of about 80 to 100 questions. We collected 768 completed surveys. And with that information, we also determined that there were some areas that we wanted to know a little more about. So we convened six focus groups across the community. This is just another representation of the of images related to the data collection. And so as a result of the review of the existing data and the data we collected in the focus groups, 
these were, actually this is where we collected information from. So we distributed surveys to all of these places or went there and sat down with residents to have them completed. So once we did that, just know that the steering committee really was committed to getting responses that represented the population. And that's why you saw that last slide, all the places we went to. Uh, we tracked demographics to make certain that we had a fairly good representation. So we looked at income and education and race and ethnicity and gender and age and zip code. We sought to make sure that the uh, data was closely aligned to the census data for income, age, ethnicity, and zip code. And then in areas where the data itself wasn't as aligned, we did, we, we um, solicited the, the support of a statistician who helped us to do some statistical analysis so we, so we could make sure that the data did ref, in fact reflect the population. So with all of that work we did to analyze the data, getting input from the community, these were the 50 items that rose to the top. As you can imagine, they're all important, but we're gonna have to do a little more drilling down because we don't really have manpower and dollars, et cetera, to focus on all 50. But these were the 50 that surfaced. So what we did, we decided to figure out, or to think about how we were gonna look across the community and make sure everyone was included. And so to do that, we developed what we called priority categories. And they are as follows. Early childhood, ages zero to five. Children, ages six to 10. Youth, ages 11 to 17. Adults, ages 18 to 64. Older adults, 65 and older. And then we looked at the family unit and then the community at large. So these were the categories we used to sort of group that previous slide you saw. And when we did that, the steering committee took that slide of 50 and then prioritized them under those categories. And this work, this slide shows the result of that work. So for early, the early childhood category, zero to five, the steering committee determined that the priorities were kindergarten readiness for children zero to five, with a focus on low rate of grade level reading, and children not accessing or having uh, primary care. Then for children six to 10, the focus was to be high rates of overweight or obesity and academic attainment <coughs> high school graduation. For youth ages 11 to 17, limited teen activities and high rates of youth involvement in, juvenile, in the juvenile justice system. For adults 18 to 64, limited economic opportunities and limited health literacy. For older adults, 65 and older, the priorities were a need for increased services for older adults to age in place, and then quality elder care and the inability to afford medication. For the family unit, the priorities were inability to afford food and mental health concerns. For the community at large, the two priorities were insufficient knowledge of community and health resources and substance <coughs> use. So at this point, we, the steering committee did the work to get the 50 down to these 14. But then the next step was 14, again, all are important, but we needed to fine tune that a little bit more. So we decided the best way to do that is to go back to the community and to ask them, what would you like for us to focus on? So that's what we did. We then convened what we called a health launch. Uh, it ultimately ended up that we did the launch at the Clifton Forge Fire Department. Had a wonderful response. These are the questions we asked. Of those 14 items, which are the most important to your family and which will drive our community to be healthier? So those in attendance actually voted. And now you see the focus areas that resulted from the votes of the community. <coughs> One focus area is knowledge of resources with the target being the community at large, substance use with the target being the community at large, 
and kindergarten readiness and early literacy with the target being early childhood and children zero to five. So with those as the focus areas, I'm just gonna show you a couple of slides of data that really supports those choices. And again, these are choices that the community made. So one of the, que one of the questions we asked on the, question on the questionnaire we distributed was, I feel confident I have all the information I need to manage my health and make good health decisions. And if you look at that graph, about 40% of folks really didn't feel that confident. Right, didn't really feel that confident that they had knowledge, that they had the information to manage their resources and to make good health decisions. And then we asked in focus groups, when somebody needs specific health care services, what types of resources exist in your community? And for the most part, these are the responses. They were certainly concerned about specialized doctors and caregivers and mental health services, about emergency room and urgent care usage, and then the issue of sliding free or free care. So even though these are in fact issues, part of the discussion around this was, well, we, we are a community that has some, off, some things to offer with respect to these items. And it was determined that there was some concern that folks just didn't know how to navigate and get to the resources. So knowledge of resources, again, was something that the community selected the part of the work with respect to the steering committee and the community was to form what we called action teams to devise a plan to address that focus area. And so the goal for the, this action team came up with was to increase knowledge of and access to community resources. And their objective is by 2022 to increase knowledge of resources as measured by an increased usage of information and referral systems. And the focus of this group, <clears throat> we heard a lot of information about 211 and the Virginia Navigator System. Now as we move through this period of implementation, we will be revisiting and adjusting each of these goals and objectives as we need to. So progress to date with respect to this committee, the committee is evaluating the strategies, strategies of promoting existing information and referral systems. And one of the things they're thinking about doing is creating a printed resource guide. All right, so substance use was another one of the focus areas. The target here is the community. On the questionnaire, we asked what are the top five most important issues that affect your health in your community or affect health in your community? And you can see number two had to, be with, uh, had to do with drug use. We also asked during the past 30 days, did you, and then these were the answer, these were the options that folks could choose. And you'll see that 23% uh, <coughs> approximately chose use tobacco, and another 11% had uh, uh, five if they were male or four if they were female drinks at one time within the past 30 days. So we took that information to develop goals and objectives too for substance use. And the goal is to reduce substance use in use, excuse me, to reduce substance use in youth and adults. And objective one is by 2022 to reduce youth tobacco and nicotine use by 5% as measured by the Youth Risk Behavior Survey. Objective two is to decrease the stigma and fear associated with addiction. Objective three is to, uh, by 2022, increase access to treatment. And objective four is by 2022, reduce the availability, availability of opioid medications that could be, you, could be diverted for misuse in the community. So with respect to progress to date, this know that there is an opioid awareness event planned for September 28th at 6.30 p.m. at the Jackson River Sports Complex. The event will feature a keynote speaker who's actually moved through the process of addiction to recovery and is now successfully doing uh, presentations and work and contributing to society. There'll also be a concert and community resources available. This event is hosted by one of the partners, the Allegheny Highlands Healthy Youth Coalition. 
Also know that the Covington Health Department has drug disposal kits available to any and all community members and organizations to promote safe disposal of medication. And the third uh, focus area is kindergarten readiness and early literacy. And the target for this uh, topic is early childhood ages zero to five. And this chart really just reflects the things that we look for when we talk about uh, kindergarten readiness and early literacy. Uh, on the child questionnaire, we asked if you have a child or children between the ages of four to six, do you feel that they, and you'll see some of the questions there, are able to follow directions, know the alphabet, uh, have preschool experience, are not fearful or anxious when I leave, and you see the responses. And the important thing, or the important connection here is that those are the things we look for when we talk about children being ready for kindergarten. And we want them ready for kindergarten because the literature shows if you're ready for kindergarten, you're likely to be more successful as you proceed through the grades. If we look at this, we can look at the passage rate for third grade reading subject standards of learning. So that's third grade passage rate for the SOLs. And if we just, we can certainly look at the trend, but if we just focus on 2017, which is when uh, the data is last available, you'll see that in Virginia, the rate was 72%, and in Allegheny and Covington, the rates are lower. So part of the work for this group is to increase kindergarten readiness and early literacy. That is, in fact, the goal. And objective one for this group is by 2022, to increase the number of students who are ready for kindergarten to 90% as measured by the PALS K assessment and the Virginia Kindergarten Readiness Assessment. Objective two is to increase, is by 2022, 75% of students in the Allegheny County and Covington Public Schools will be reading at grade level by the end of third grade as evidenced by results from the third grade SOLs. With respect to progress to date, there was an early childhood launch event held on August 12, 2019 to launch the plan at Edgemont Primary School. That was the location of the launch. Uh, also, the Allegheny Foundation has awarded funding to support 19 preschool classrooms to expand the Streaming 3 curriculum. Streaming through curriculum is one of the, getting that implemented everywhere was one of the action steps under this uh, target, under this focus area. And so it's pretty much been accomplished thanks to the Allegheny Foundation. A third note to report is that all classrooms are well underway with implementation of Streaming 3. So again, we are, we've sort of been through this diagram. Uh, most of it, and we're at the implementation stage, so we are actually on the ground working. Um, know that uh, Live Well Allegheny Highlands has been hard at work in partnership with the community. Again, our focus areas are knowledge of resources, substance use, and kindergarten readiness and early literacy. We certainly invite you to participate or follow along with us as we work to enhance the well-being of all who live, work, or play, actually, in our community. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Any questions for Nancy? Okay, I wanted to ask you. Yes. You had a um, survey's return was 768. Was that a reasonable sampling? Or yes, that was a... That, oh, well. Now, we certainly love to have had every member of the community complete a survey, <coughs> but that number was a good sampling. Thank you for asking. Thank you. Thank you.